Conscious Caracal here, or Aaron's Fun Sale. And tonight we're going to be speaking about a topic that is not only applicable to South Africa in regards to many of the conversations that will sprout from it, but we will be analyzing South African case studies in this conversation. Tonight I'm joined by someone that doesn't need an introduction on this channel, uh, Mr. Robert Daigan or Marubane, as you might know him on YouTube or Twitter. And uh, he's going to be talking about specifically. Uh, an essay that he wrote that's not out yet. It should be out at the end of the week on the Whippinor website, and I will be uh, sharing that on my Twitter feed when uh, whenever it is published. But uh, we will be getting into uh, some of the things that he discusses in that essay uh, and maybe giving you a little bit of a sneak peek, but not going into all the details so that if you want to read further and go more in-depth on what we're talking about, you can read that uh, essay when it comes up. So uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight again, Rob, and I'm looking forward to the chat. Yeah, no, cheers. Hi. All right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as I told you off air, uh, I think uh, this is your first appearance sporting the new stash uh, online as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually just, you, uh, it started out because, you know, you do that thing when you shave your beard off where you, you, you like try a few sort of gradients first. <laughs> And then my fiance sort of told me to stop with the moustache and she likes it. But in this light, it looks sort of very blonde. So um, <laughs> it's showing up very faintly. Mm. Um, so All anyway. right. But yeah. Um, yeah. So I've already read your, your essay, as you know, but uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail regarding some of the things that stood out to me that I think are, are very interesting. Now, the thing that I wanted to start off with, it's actually a simple question. Uh, many people already instinctively know the answer to this, but uh, you actually tackle this in the essay. And your answer to this question is actually very insightful. And that's the, uh, the what I would rather call it a deceptively simple question of yeah. what do you understand under the rule of law and what that uh -huh. is, what that means uh, in this context. Yeah, well, I mean, look, it was a response to, um, on the 7th of January, there was this big fat article by, um, well, I can't really call it fat because it's not, um, <laughs> well, it's not very substantive. Um, but there, there was this sort of uh, bloviating article written by Lindiwe Sisulu. Hmm. Um, and she, she, she had a go at the, the rule of law and she says, well, you know, it hasn't, you know, given us anything of real value. Uh, and you know if, if rule of law is so great great why is everything falling apart and everyone is so poor so mm. we don't really need this what we need is results and mm. i mean i i i pre, uh, i i mean we all can and the thing is i wasn't going to write anything on it but i sort of noticed that over time everyone was having a go at her about this but saying mm. nothing of substance because all of the responses were extremely extremely predictable they said oh you know how dare you threaten the rule of law our our precious judges you know and i think mm. you know, but you know look okay she's she's uh, an evil insane thieving corrupt psychopath but she kind of has a point um because yeah, I mean, hot, it, the first <laughs> hot take already dropped <laughs> oh come on it's not a hot take it's it's a member yeah. of the anc i mean who thinks these people are <laughs> Oh, anyway. Um, so, anyway, uh, yeah. So, I mean, most of it's pretty standard, box standard stuff. It's like you know, you know, the, what's it? What's it? The whites curate, manage wealth, while the blacks <laughs> manage poverty, and things. You know, like little sort of like pithy phrases. She's borrowed, yeah, little borrowed sound from bites else. everywhere. But then uh, we're yeah, not I'm, even going to talk about the 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 plagiarism that's fraught throughout the piece. Oh, but it um, was very interesting because yeah. here's the thing. Actually, my so my first thing I did is like, okay, okay. Well, we're talk, we're arguing about whether or not there should be rule of law. As if we even have it. Mm. That's, that's hence it. the hence the the title of your piece and also the the shared title of this uh, of the stream. Yeah, well, actually, the title of the piece was called "The Judges and Their Wigs" with an yeah, H. Yeah, no, I had to shorten uh, it a, a little bit for uh, for YouTube's sake. Yeah, 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 because it's 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 sort of an uh, it's sort of an obscure pun. The basic point I was saying is that most of the poli political commentators who, who are commenting on this are sort of liberal progressives in mm. the English constitutional tradition. Mm. And, um, you, you know, people, you know, uh, newspapers like Mail and Guardian and uh, Daily Maverick and so on. And they all more or less had the same. I mean, my favorite one was, what was it? So what's her name? Rebecca Davis. 
Her, hers was the shallowest article because all she did is accuse Lindiwe Zulu, uh, not Lindiwe Zulu, that's a different idiot, uh, Lindiwe Sisulu, of, <laughs> uh, of being a hypocrite. And it's like there was no engagement with any of the like mm. major debate at all. Um, and then you get Feriel Hafaji, who's the, the most beautiful response. Um, <laughs> she said, um, and by beautiful, I mean f stupid. Because um, she said... Uh, in the same uh, sense that Zapiro cartoons in the modern day are beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's like... It, it's, no, it beautifully the misses way. the mark and is just a representation right. of a fantasy reality. Yeah, you, you're making me think of like a, a Richard Poplack article from a while ago where, I mean, I'd recently just written a big takedown of like, you know, what was going on in South Africa for, we did an essay, we did a, uh, we, we actually did a thing with Alex Kashuta on the same topic. Hmm. But so Richard Poplack's take on the, on the, on the June or July riots, I forget which month it was, um, he, his take on it was like, uh, just, he identified everything that was wrong with the country. And then he said, Okay, now it's solution time. More socialism. <laughs> it's like what well, my just, favorite. Just hit, uh, we're headed my to a mountain. We're the... headed for a rock. Just hit the foot on the gas. Make sure you crash really fucking hard. Mm, uh, my favorite was that that recent Zapiro cartoon where when the the first half or the first part of the Zondu Commission uh, report came out, he drew it with like a, a very angry mm. or cross looking uh, Ramaphosa and the, the Zondu standing there, and then the the RET or Radical Economic Transformation bus comes along, driven by Jacob oh, yes, Zuma, this, but but just this, magically, this, this. Uh, mm. but just magically. <laughs> uh, Zwelle Mkiza is just on the bus, but he has no connection to the RET faction. He's pretty much a Ramaphosa loyalist. Yes, but he's yes. corrupt, so therefore he must be RET. Yeah. So Hafaji's article, just uh, just to briefly finish my mm. point, the way that she misses the point is brilliant because she names a whole string of British colonies in Africa that decolonized and turned into shitholes and said, well, we can't let that happen here but like very like throughout the article she's like really trying to save herself from making it obvious that what she's kind of doing is defending the british empire now <laughs> it's, she's it's pulling a, it's in a if, if she were to analyze her piece from a from her own perspective she'd pretty yeah. much uh, accuse herself of uh, committing a zillism or a helen zillism yeah i mean this is this is the silly bit she goes like you know oh and what's happening in zimbabwe it's atrocious it's awful and I went and look up, and there's, there's uh, still articles being published today that the Zimbabwean judiciary is under threat. I mean, for... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that ship sailed so right. long ago; it's been scrapped mm. already. I mean, right. are you kidding me? And I mean, this is the situation we're in. We're already past the point. We had, we had, um, so, so the the, the same th the thing that happened at the same time as uh, Lindiwe Sisulu's article, which was the real scandal, which everyone so somehow managed to miss, um, except for the DA uh, sort of um, elite um, at the moment, is um, the fact that uh, the president perjured mm. himself in the Zondu Commission by pretending that he doesn't pick jo judges um, on the basis yeah. of car trade deployment programs. And it the thing is, the very next day or something, the DA leaked an internal ANC report showing that they actually pre-select the judges before they are mm. shown to the Judicial Service Committee. And it's not like the uh, Judicial Service Commission is... Sorry, commission, not committee. Judicial Service Commission is um, entirely above board. I mean, you know, uh, for, for the political elements, they've got, you know, like the one DA guy and the one IFP guy and then the rest are mm. charterists. And it's... Um, it's, it's just it's just depressing. Mm. Um, yeah, but I should you, say uh, the one DA got woman, but uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, going on. <laughs> uh, you touched on something there that I think pretty much uh, segues into what I wanted to talk about. Where your essay starts with the three questions of: Is there a rule of law in South Africa? Can there be a rule of law? And yeah, there is is but, there one? Uh, ought there to be? And can there yes. be? So um, yeah, let's take that. Uh, let's take that in three phases. Let's start off with the is. Mm. Uh, that I think that'll lay the foundation for the other two. And also well, I mean, explains the title of the stream. Well, I mean, this is the interesting thing. So Lindiwe Sisulu, um, she uh, she plagiarized in her um, she plagiarized in her essay um, an extract from um, uh, Dominic Grieve, is a, a conservative MP, 
Uh, he was a minister under David Cameron, uh, sort of, sort of like a, a conservative Eurocrat, um, very mm. much against Brexit and everything. You know, one of these sort of grey men who, you know, sort of immobile establishment types. Um, but he he was writing this. Uh, he was giving this speech on the rule of law, and he um, this this is somehow I have no idea how Landiwe Sisulu, who's probably never picked up a book in her life, ended up reading uh, finding this obscure little political speech. I suspect she gave the uh, task for the research task to one of her underlings. Um, so anyhow, uh, let me just read out this uh, a little section from it because I, mm. I I cribbed this little section from uh, from. Um, his speech, which I thought was quite good for defining hmm. uh, what rule of law was, because it actually brings up the, the the hypocrisy of the modern Western idea of rule of law. So he says, uh, in his 2010 uh, book, Lord Bingham identified the core principle of the rule of law as being that all persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly and pros pr uh, prospectively promulgated and publicly administered in the courts. He went, out, uh, he went on to outline eight principles in which he saw as being the key ingredients necessary to support that aim. In brief, these were, one, that the rule of law, the, that the law must be accessible, intelligible, clear, and predictable. Two, the questions of legal rights and liability and, uh, should ordinarily be resolved by the exercise of the law and not the exercise of discretion. Three, laws should apply equally to all. Four, ministers and public officials must exercise the power conferred in good faith, fairly, the purposes of which they were conferred, reasonably and without exceeding the limits of such powers. Five, the law must afford adequate protection of fundamental human rights. Six, the state must provide a way of resolving disputes which the parties cannot resolve themselves. The adju uh, adju adjudicative pro procedures provided by the state should be fair. And eight, the rule of law requires compliance by the state with its obligations in international as well as national laws. By observing these eight principles, in particular the fifth, affording adequate protection of fundamental human rights, we avoid the dilemma identified with Professor Joseph Ratz in his 1979 work, The Authority of Law. Professor Ratz argued that seemingly within the framework of the rule of law, there can exist societies which oppress minorities, condone slavery, and support sexual inequalities, all of which would be abhorrent to liberal democracies. And yet, by adhering to strict legal structures and procedures, such societies could still legitimately claim to excel their conformity to the rule of law. Absent protection for human rights, courts and legal systems may deprive fellow citizens of their freedom, property, and ultimately their very existence. Hmm. So, I mean, the, the thing is, and you listen to that, you know, that's a, a wonderful, reasonable hmm. argument, an incredible wish list. And the thing hmm. is that there's not a state on the planet that delivers any of these. <laughs> Right. There's some Not even talking one. about South Africa delivering it. <laughs> I mean, look, maybe you could maybe argue that Switzerland does, um, mm. but but I mean, outside that, I, I can't think of one. Mm. Uh, look at look at the look at the UK and America. The, you know, these black sites where they torture political dissidents. Shut, uh, they collaborate with the um, uh, with the banks to shut them out of the banking systems. They arrest people who uh, who are whistleblowers. They mm. Uh, engage in vast amounts of organized crime. Uh, the the uh, the politicians uh, have uh, sanctions against freedom of speech that are both um, deliberately ambiguous and completely unpredictable, which results mm. in the uh, in the arrest of at least ten people every day in the United Kingdom. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say at least ten. I should say nearly ten. It's actually nine mm. per day. <clears throat> uh, but the I mean. Whatever we're talking about, the thing is, then you go, okay, well, maybe there are some nasty little laws that are a bit overbearing, you know. Um, mm, the mm. truth is that this this all erodes the the idea that you know a bill of rights will protect you. I mean, everyone has signed up to the UN Charter of Human Rights, and it hasn't done a, a bloody jot of good. Um, we, you know, I mean, the United States that sort of claims to be for you know human rights, rule of law, wherever they go in the world. They absolutely destroy any trace of law and order that they find, and they leave behind broken um, states, which are hubs for transnational organized crime. And that's all they do. Um, the, the the very notion that there's any nation on the planet that really respects the rule of law is 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 to me kind of silly. Um, there are small, maybe some small nations that count, but I I can't see any big ones that do. Um, and the, the thing is, now, now we look at a society in, in South Africa, 
And we look at what Lindsay Wizzelou is saying. She says, okay, well, everyone keeps talking about this rule of law thing. What the hell is it? She doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand the basic concepts. I mean, the, the, the concept is that the institutions are going to manage society in a very sort of brutal top-down way um, that is extremely rigid and inflexible, but that the system can be changed once every four or five years by general election if, if it's not going right. Um, but you, you know, this doesn't really, this doesn't really change anything because I mean, anyone who's looked at British politics for the last 30 years, 50 years, 60 years has noticed that there's the same permanent elite that's been running the show since the year dot. Same can be said mm -hmm. from the United States. We had one disruptive, uh, president, uh, in Donald Trump, the last fellow who, uh, may, may, um, sort of seemed to be disruptive of the natural flow of things was Andrew Jackson. That was the 19th century. And we, yeah. you, you know, th there's a stable ruling class. And so for most of the, most of the uh, article actually leaned very heavily on uh, Professor Kurs Malan, uh, um, mm. who I'm increasingly in, uh, in conversation with. His, his book, uh, There Is No Supreme Constitution, is, very, mm. is extremely helpful because he goes into extraordinary detail about exactly the ways in which the, the judiciary have been collaborating with the poli ideological political project of the ANC. So they will hold the ANC to account, but never for, uh, but never for ideological overreach. Right. It's not because it, it's not about the, the, the primary thing that they're actually recognizing is the product of transformation. And you've got to ask yourself, so what are we being transformed into? Well, the idea mm. is to have a homogenous black dominated society that tends to the the progresses toward communism. This is well understood by every single person. The juridical scholars, the um, the leading court justices, have all said that the equality that they're aiming for is not equality of opportunity. It's not formal legal equality. It's equality of outcomes. It's it's the understand that the 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 end point that we're all aiming for in this society is for all of us to live like. Uh, people in the Khmer Rouge, but to do it with slightly less amputations and mm. bloodletting. Um, well, that's the thing. I, uh, I've uh, recently finished reading that Benatar's book on the fall of UCT. Uh, actually, oh, it was very insightful. Um, but uh, what you're describing there pretty much matches up with the, the transform transformationists within that institution as well. They're not secretive about what their ideal utopia or about what, or what they want to build yeah. is or what they're fighting for. It's, it's not about all these liberal values, as you mentioned there, about equality of opportunity, equality of all these very nice, uh, nice and beautiful flowery ideas. Um, none of them come into the pl into play, but then all these liberals just sit back and say, well, and just capitulate and appease, uh, even though the demands that are being given or being uh, asked of them are very clear in what they're trying to achieve. Well, I mean, it, it's hard for people to, to argue against equality. So the, the thing is that equality is always can, can, is, is an ultimate liberal sort of value. And so because they recognize that equality is a good thing to begin with, I mean, the very idea that any kind of equality is good um, in any kind of general way immediately opens you up to people who can leverage that to achieve any uh, whatever they want. And the thing is that ANC cadres are pushing for this kind of transformation. What they really actually want is, you know, untrammeled black nationalism, black supremacy, mm. black national socialism. And you speak to any sort of enlightened um, sort of popular black intellectual, whether it's Aubrey Machikli or whether it's um, uh, Dumiso Dladla or whether it's... Um, What's that guy? Um, Loazi Loshava. All of them have the same idea, which is mm. that white people must be dispossessed of all property, removed from all la uh, fixed landed property as well, um, and must be... And removed from all institutional positions. Yeah, and they must... They, they must they, basically, there are no political... There's, there's, a, there's a metaphor that's used... Um, in by Robert Subukwe and by Steve Biko, where they talk about um, there can be no talking about legal rights whatsoever mm. for white people. They're, they they don't have legal rights until we've completely dispossessed them and beaten them into submission so that they beg for their rights. 
So we, we are only allowed rights once we've been stripped of all of them and all of our ability to provide for ourselves and survive. And from the position of somebody who is on the brink of death, we then are allowed to ask for, um, for political rights. This, this, is the, this is the general idea. Mm. Although um, I, I am stripping away some of the, some of the more delicate ways that it's phrased. But generally speaking, I mean, this is identical to the position of, um, you know, the National mm. Socialists in Germany. I mean, at no point did they come out and say, we're going to kill all the Jews. They sort mm. of by increments said, well, we have to take away all of their property and remove them from all mm. of the land and do this, this and this. And it yeah. sort of just makes it so that you can't do anything else except either enslave them or kill them. And the Germans did both. Um, and so, I mean, look. Here's the thing, we, we don't really, there's, there's no one who sort of like considers us to be real citizens here. I mean, we, we have people who read out in parliament. Remember when the EWC bill was being passed? We had a member of the ANC who said, it's, uh, it's actually a travesty that any of you people are allowed to vote in this country. No one censured him for this. No one picked it up in the bloody newspapers. I mean, it's like, oh, well, you know, another black politician says we don't deserve rights. Uh, it's Tuesday. So... And, and the thing is, it's, it's become normalized everywhere in the world. The, the idea that the idea that you know white people are actually fully human is is like such an alien concept these days. Um, it's it's the kind of it's it's it seems like something out of you know Narnia. If someone says you know actually we kind of should be treated as if we have full you know political rights. No, sorry. Um, and the thing is that. The way to actually look at it when you talk about transformation in, in, in South Africa is not, well, they wanted to be representative. It's that every single social circle must be monitored by black people. There can be no place where any minority is allowed to form any community bonds. Anytime you form any community bonds as a white person, you're evil. Anytime you form community bonds as a colored person, you're evil. Anytime you form community bonds as an Indian person, you're evil. You are only allowed to form community bonds on the permission of black people. That is the those are the terms of the country that is being created. Because even those who think it's wrong will never speak up about it. Mm. And I don't expect them to because we've had enough time for mm. even one person to is, come up and say something about it. The thing is, I don't think this is a, a race specific thing in regards to the opposition to it. I would use the, uh, America as an no, example. No, we're in Yugoslavia. You see, you we're see in Yugoslavia. In, uh, in America we're where the type of policies that they've been yeah. indulging in and the, the resistance is pretty much very small. I mean, uh, if you look at the type of uh, just absolute yeah. infringements that have happened uh, to freedom in the West in, in the past two years, yeah. and you compare that to the type of protest that you saw. I mean, you can you can play up the type of protest that you've seen as much as you want. It was still yeah. it's still paling in comparison relatively to the amount of infringement that there's been. And I mean, you can look at, for example, a country like Australia, for example, one of the worst cases of well, the it. The thing where is, it's actually popular. You get a Australia. protest, you get a protest, and then people get the shit beat out of them, and then they don't protest again. That's the mm. the pattern that we saw all across the world. Well, and look, Western people is, have, have Western people mm. used to believe in things. I mean, I think the lot, but I mean, on it, to be perfectly honest, the last time any Western person believed in anything, uh, any sort of large group of Westerners believed in anything enough to risk their lives was probably the 1970s. No one believes in anything anymore. Not at all. Um, the Western, Western civilization is, is kind of dead. There are no values holding it together. There is nothing but greed, power, and lies. There's there's absolutely nothing left. There's not a single institution that hasn't been captured by people dead set on destroying it. I mean, think about that for a second. There does not exist an institution in the West that is not run by people whose stated public aims is to destroy that institution forever. I mean, think how insane the situation is we're in. I, <laughs> what the hell are we doing? I mean, yeah, we're, we're but no, I think it's know. a it's a good. Well, the past two years have been very revealing in regards to how much uh, oppression and how much uh, infringement on people's rights that people are willing to take. And I don't think mm. the type of discriminatory policies that we see in South Africa and people going along with it and the majority of people supporting it or not saying or at least not standing up yeah. against it is a, a South African specific thing. It's pretty much no, the nature of humanity that we've seen in the past two years all across the world. 
No, no, no. But I mean, look, th this is a slightly different problem. Um, now, usually you should be able to expect people to at least stand up for themselves, for their own ethnic group, for their own religious group, for their own whatever identity category you want. I think it, it's it, it's normal and healthy for people to to sort of have a sense of boundaries um, in terms of you know fundamental political rights, vital interests, and so on. Um, I won't fundamental political rights as a sort of a whole long philosophy. I don't really ascribe to, but you know, essential vital right uh, interests. You expect people to stand up for them, but the funny thing is, in the West, most people don't. Um, in right. fact, if, if even if you even if you go to like quite reactionary circles, uh, intellectual circles, the predominant thing that you hear from people, even if they're extremely far right, is that they say, "No, no, no, no we're not going to bother. We're not going to stick our head above the parapet. The only thing we can do now is wait for the system to collapse." I mean, the level of absolute despair that permeates every. And if you go on the far left, you hear similar things. So people mm. kind of people have completely lost interest in uh, lost hope for revolution. Mm. Black nationalists look at what happened to BLM and they understand they've been used. Mm. Okay, well, American black nationalists anyway, they understand that they've been used. Um, and the communists, they understand that their hopes are kind of dashed. Everyone sort of look at this and says, "Well, okay, we know the guys who are running the show have a." sort of Fabian socialist, uh, liberal progressive uh, sort of perspective on, on politics and rights. But what that really is, is various layers of social ideology that are arranged to appeal to different strata of society mm. in order to serve the permanent uh, interests of a permanent ruling class that does not actually mm. plug into... They, they don't, they're not part of any permanent institution. So let's say we go back in time and we say, uh, we, uh, you know, the most powerful moneyed individuals in any given country or polity. They would have positions in the government. They would have positions uh, either as members of the aristocracy who are recognized as part of the political process, or they would be the king. And yeah. now all of those people who are the most powerful and have the greatest number of influence are completely obscured by by institutions that they control indirectly, um, and it's it's not like these people are, are sort of secretive people. They're they're heads of the largest major banks. They're sort of these old European dynasties. Um, they're American. They're sort of American um, bloodlines from the robber baron uh, robber baron era of the late nineteenth century. Um, and it's the same permanent transatlantic ruling class who is yeah. using the, the rem, rem, remnants of the institutions to consolidate power and basically mm. to hold things in place and liquidate what remains of the human cattle that they preside over. And mm. it's every single idea that they sell through the major institutions that they control has the same flavor to it. It's it's sort of, you know, human beings are bad. There are too many of you sort of useless eaters wandering around. Uh, we need to control what you do. And the idea that you can stand up for yourself has to be curtailed because the only way that anyone can really stand up for each other is usually is actually nowadays through nationalism. It's the one thing that is absolutely forbidden at every single level of society is nationalism. Um, I don't mean sort of, you know, uh, civic nationalism, e although even that is sort of being sidelined nowadays. Um, mm. You know, any kind of cultural, uh, religious or racial nationalism of any kind is that's really the sort of nasty, toxic, evil outside. Don't let them get an inch of power because, you know, I mean, the, the reason it's done is because any, uh, the, and this is, this is kind of an important point that marries back into Kurs Malan's philosophy and the reason that he his critique of the rule of law is so sound. His idea that you have this constitution, you write it down, you've got a codified system of laws and institutions, they're going to live forever, you don't have to worry about it, they'll reproduce themselves. Not true. I mean, the, there, is a, there is a ruling class that develops in any kind of polity, as you set it up, that has its own interests. And that ruling class will have its own sort of culture. And the institutions that it cares the most about will be party politics, academia, education, media. It will make sure it holds on to these things and consolidates a, a, a uniform opinion amongst them. Yeah. Well, and, then what a you have is, 
and they separate from the rest of society. And in South Africa, it's, this is very uh, pertinent. Because what you'll notice is in all the major newspapers, everyone shares the same perspectives. There's this narrow sort of uh, spectrum that re- re- revolves from very, very sort of progressive um, liberal. I mean, think about Ivo Fechter, who's quite lefty. He's a real left winger. But he's the furthest right that you're allowed to be. In fact, he's kind of off the edge because he works for the Institute of Race Relations, who, again, is a soft, nice, liberal, non-racialist organization. So you've got you've got these guys who are considered the furthest right you're allowed to be, sort of nice, cuddly, non-racist liberals, and then um, and then it sort of slides into black national socialism. That's our political circle, and then anyone who, who exhibits any sort of loyalty to tribe or any kind of traditional morality, they're completely forbidden. So anyone like Jacob Zuma, you can steal as much as you want, you can destroy institutions as much as you want. Becky's cool, Ramaphosa is cool. But if you like traditional morality, you're dead in the water. So they had to go after Jacob Zuma. Um, And you have this permanent class that sort of, it doesn't want transformation to happen too quickly because even the people who believe in the sort of radical uh, economic transformation model of things where it's um, a a sort of executive that acts by fiat in in, in society, has no institutions that check it, no laws that check it, just complete decree that yeah. kind of that kind of you know politburo type style of things um even people who believe in that they don't want things to change too quickly because they'll jeopardize their ability to get rich and then you have people in you know the da and people in the newspapers and so on who kind of think well you know i kind of want things to change really really slowly we don't mind seeing we, we don't mind seeing ourselves get completely demographically overwhelmed, despite the fact that the culture of the majority is fundamentally hostile and does not does not sort of um, brook any moral limits on ethnic interethnic violence. Um, we don't mind that. What we're worried about is that it happens too fast for us to. Um, uh, get some public prestige, make some money, or get out of the country. That's all, you know. And so there's there, there's a lack of real sort of fundamental commitment. And this happens when you don't have nationalism. Because the thing is, one of the things that nationalism is, in an abstract sense, is you have um, people who have common ties, however, and, and this, is the, uh, this is the thing, is a nation can be built out of people of, various heterogeneous different ethnicities but if they understand themselves as being of a nation then generally speaking they can construct um they can construct a common identity the problem with doing it in south africa where we are so different where we have nothing in common fundamentally is that you have to you have to very brutally socially engineer this enormous mass of tens of millions of people forcing them by violence which is how the law works law works through violence every sort of power that comes from the state works through violence by doing it like this this is you have to violently strip people of their culture you have to strip people of their property you have to strip people of their autonomy and their spatial um, sovereignty in order to push them into this box it makes everyone into this gray slurry which you can command but even then i mean you can look at fairly um, homogenous countries in europe their elite is still completely detached from the from the desires of their people. They still do silly things like, um, you know, all of these COVID policies, where they're not interested in whether or not the people want it. It's about how do we engineer the opinions of the people to conform to what we want them to do. The relation is back is is quite backwards. Hmm. And what what Kursmalan says is you can't have law working like that. The idea of the rule of law. There's only way that you one way that you can make it really work long term is <laughs> sorry I just listened to the comment the only way you can work make it work really long term is if the norms of the community are reflected in the law because if they're not then what you have is a situation now where only a specialist who's really studied the law can understand whether something may, or might or might not be legal or illegal. Because what the law says has no relation to the moral constitution of society. Look at when we legalized gay marriage, uh, abortion, anything like that. 
South Africans didn't want any of that. I mean, we imposed it on them. Did they want open borders? No, they didn't. You know, um, did we want, <laughs> did we, and, and, and beyond this kind of fundamental disconnect, you've also got the problem is that the South African government does not rule by law. They rule through arbitrary use of organized crime. Look at how the Cape is, uh, what the Cape is subjected to. They they bust people in from the Eastern Cape, uh, and the ANC allocates them shacks to live in, on the basis of finding wherever the DA wants to put public housing, usually for colored people who've been waiting for 25, 30 years for public housing. They have to publish it in the in the um, in the municipal gazette. In order, in order for them to actually legally be allowed to develop that land for public housing. The second they do that, the ANC makes sure that it's squatted on, and the law has been designed to prevent anyone from removing these people. Then mm. what the ANC does is, of course, they extract, they, they use the, the, their enforcers to extract rent, um, and then you look at the systematic protection of the gangs in the uh, Western Cape to actually defend violent criminals who murder between 20 and 50% of the popu uh, of the uh, of the homicide victims in a given year. And the, the, the situation is absolutely beyond disastrous. It's beyond evil. Uh, if, if you have a leadership co uh, contest in the ANC, all of a sudden you see, you know, taxi bosses murdering each other en masse because um, each cartel is attached to a different internal local faction. The, 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 the scale of, arbitrary um, violence that, that is attached to ANC power struggles is utterly enormous. The, I mean, the, the notion that we're struggling over the rule of law in this country is beyond me. To, to, establish, mm. uh, to establish the rule of law might be great, but how are you going to reconcile the fundamental nature of tradi uh, traditional customary law in African society with the common law basis of Western society which is again, you, you know, Western Christianized society, which is the basis of the Western part of the country. You can't reconcile these two parts of the population, mm. not under law. You can impose it violently against people's will, but you cannot reconcile them. Mm. Before we continue, uh, I just want to say good evening to Mr. Quentin Ferreira, uh, who was oh, my cool. guest last week on the show. He's tuned in all the way from Portugal, our resident proud Pora. Uh, and he also says good to see you all as well. No, well, thank you very nice. much, Quentin. Nice to see you in the chat too. Um, and I see, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Dak T says, uh, hit the like button. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And then Sideliner Opinion says, anarchy is promoted to justify authoritarian government intervention. What are your thoughts mm. on that, Rob? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I disagree. Do you think so? Um. Look, anarchy tyranny, it's not that the anarchy justifies the tyranny. It's that the anarchy and the tyranny apply to different oh, sectors yeah. of society. Hmm. Because there's one, one group that you need to finally control through rule of law because your economy can't run if they are exposed to too much chaos. Um, and then there's another group that you can sort of sub subject to large amounts of violence because they're largely fungible. So... Hmm. The middle classes and the upper classes have to be subjected to legal terror. The underclasses have, because the legal terror does one thing. It makes people hang on the every word of the people who are handing down policy. You mm. okay. Ooh, am I allowed to wear red shoes today? Pretty please, Mr. Commissar. And the, the, the people in the underclasses, they just have to scramble and get by. There's always someone who will be able to sort of make their way through the carnage that is the South African un um, undergrowth in order to make their way to work on time, do their menial factory job for 10 hours a day and bugger off home. There's always mm. going to be someone who is willing to do that. And it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you don't have to worry about these people. If, you're, if, you're, if all you're concerned with is staying in power and making money, that's not something you have to worry about. And the Americans have figured this out. The, they're actually the, uh, I mean, one thing that's been big on the news now, and most of us South Africans were having a little chuckle at it, is that we're now seeing mass train robberies hit mm. California. But here's the thing. The, the, the concentrated wealth in that part of the country is so large that, you know, it's a rounding error. 
Because look at Amazon. They don't have to worry about their, their bottom line. They're being fed off government contracts in order to um, and uh, government subsidized financial investment to run their company at a loss until it hits um, a global monopoly status over the supply chain. That's the entire point of Amazon is a concerted public-private partnership with finance and state to create a monopoly on the entire consumer value chain. Mm. So they're not worried if people are stealing from the trains. It's like, okay, well, you know, just pump a little bit more cash in. Mm. So the, 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 the insanity of this nonsense is it, it's trans it, it it, it can be sustained literally until civilization collapses. I mean, we, we see the same nonsense in South Africa. I mean, we've got one of the worst rates of cargo theft in the world, and still everything still kind of ticks along. Hmm. Uh, you know? So uh, I see there's a, a super chat here from Dabble Smith. Thank you very much. He says, uh, the rabbit hole you're going down is very interesting. These conversations are important, but just remember not to allow it to consume you, Robert. Yeah, I know. I am very pessimistic uh, on time. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm, t I'm told that a lot. I just sort of hand out tons of black pills. Um, but <laughs> I look. I mean, look. There, there are a few sort of ways that we can go out. But I mean, I got, I got the biggest black pill of all time. My father, who's an engineer, texted me this. Um, uh, he, he sent me this text today, where he was talking about thermodynamics. And uh, he said the humor de jour for thermodynamics nerds is uh, the zeroth uh, law. The consequence of the zeroth law of thermodynamics is that there is a game. The first law's uh, consequence is that you cannot win this game. The consequence of the second law is that you cannot even break even. Um, and the consequence of the third law of thermodynamics is that you can't even get out of the game. And th this is the idea of like, well, you know, you can't choose to be born. You're stuck in this thing and you are going to lose. Um, and the same, and if you believe any of the great philosophers of cycles of history, whether, you know, it's anyone from Ibn Khaldun to Toynbee to whoever, this counts for nations, this counts for corporations, this counts for pretty much everything. You know, everything dies eventually. And look, the human race has a lot more juice in it than than a lot of people reckon i think but for now there's a lot of parts of the globe that are on a downward trend and if we're going to sort of cling on to any sort of localized pockets of uh order and stability it's going to require um some very sort of bold and clever decisions um and i i, I, I as usual that that's something that usually only is partially realized no one ever gets to utopia so, yeah. but we can't, we can avoid total collapse. Um, and that's why I back something even as sort of pie in the sky as it seems. Um, that's the reason I back things like Cape Independence because, you know, the Western part of this country has an understanding of rule of law that is consonant with um, a certain Western Christianized um, perspective. Whereas the East of this country is going to be resistant to that forever. Um, they, I, I think the, the, the battle that really has to be fought um, amongst sort of culturally Bantu populations in South Africa is mostly the one between uh, radical modern national socialism and traditional legitimist patriarchy. And I think, I think in a free world where there was no you know, progressive international system, they would probably end up in a, in a, in a much more stable patriarchal system. But, the, but it's almost certain that they're going to end up, um, whether we're dragged into it or not, um, in a national socialist government. Um, and that's going to take a long, way, a long time to work out. So mm. um, I, I, I would rather get out of the way first. <laughs> well uh now that you've uh, dropped another black pull yeah i just want to thank uh Davil smith uh, for your for your super chat uh it was a uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to bring you these types of conversations it's nice to see people appreciate them um but yeah rob there's something that you mentioned that i find interesting that i would uh, 
actually like to focus on uh, as we head towards uh, more towards the end. And that is, you mentioned that, well, maybe I should phrase it this way. You mentioned that you do like to uh, uh, throw out some black pills and you are in support of something that's a, a long shot and that's Cape Independence. But yeah. when you are talking about the options that are on the table, how do you convince an average person that is, has not read any books on independence, doesn't really know what secession even means? How do you sell these types of solutions to that type of person? Well, I mean, look, you, you start from the perspective that, so, I mean, let's say, let's say you're quite deep underwater. You know that the oxygen is that way. Okay, mm -hmm. you've got a long way to swim and you feel like you might drown before you get there. But it doesn't mean you inhale the water and sink further. You, you, you've got to swim. It's like there's only one thing to do. And so you've got something like Cape Independence. We understand that it's going to be difficult. Even if we get it, it's going to be extremely messy, <laughs> extraordinarily messy. But it's literally the only option we have. I mean, let me frame it this way. So I, I had a I had a meeting um, literally the day after Lindiwe Sisulu wrote our article. I had a meeting with a senior member of the DA, and I was talking to them. Uh, I was trying to convince them why Cape Independence is the only option. Hmm. Not not that it would be kind of a nice idea, which is uh, what you get from Phil Craig, which whom I like immensely. Um, he's a very jolly fellow. He's good to be, uh, he's good to hang out with because his optimism is very contagious. But um, here's the thing. I was told, uh, I was told, and I, th I think this is a fairly common perspective because everyone you meet in, in the Western Cape says, it's a wonderful idea, but it'll never happen. Hmm. And the, there is a, there's several different flavors of it'll never happen. One is you know, the demographics will overtake us before then. Another is, um, you know, people will never organize. No one will allow it to happen. And then the third one is there'll be civil war. And here's the thing. So I've been reading a lot of black nationalists recently. And one of the things they all, main, uh, all maintain is that we are already in a low-level civil war. And in fact, they don't even say low-level civil war. They keep pointing out, that, well, the ones who are smart enough to read things, um, you know, like Dumis of Gladla is, is a very, I mean, regardless of what you may think of uh, national socialism, Gladla is, is actually a fairly smart guy and he does, he does a lot of sound research. I mean, one of the things he points out when you watch his speeches is he talks about the fact that whenever you come across descriptions of South African finance, it's always like the highest outside of a war zone. I mean, there's like one or two countries that that sort of really tip the level. Uh, oh, please don't turn into black nationalists. Well, look, I mean, the, let's not be silly. I mean, people sort of people sort of get this sort of epistemic allergy when they when they come across these people. Like, oh well, they you know they believe in something that's evil. Therefore, everything they say has to be completely stupid. Uh, not really. No, they've got a few insights, and the thing is, we don't rec we don't sort of acknowledge this. They, they, they talk about the system of laws in South Africa as this is an alien imposition. And as long as we are being governed by a Western legal system, we are still under colonialism. And I sort of thought about this. Is, they've actually kind of got a point. I mean, imagine, imagine if, the, if the Muslim minority in Great Britain reaches a point where they're about 20% of the electorate. They build a coalition with the i mean because i mean look there's 60 percent of new births are non-white in in the uk it's not un inconceivable um that they form a, a coalition that enforces sharia law over most of the country so let's say they do this i mean wh what do you how do you respond to that if you're an ordinary white white uh, white britain well then are you being colonized what do you do about that um so you know, black people sitting, okay, well, we want rid of this, you know, Western Western colonial system that dominates us. We want our land back. We want our minerals back. We want ethnic sovereignty. And I say, okay, well, I can't, uh, I, th th that's, that's neither here nor there. Whether I argue against it or not, the majority of black intellectuals believe this stuff. So I have to deal with it. So the reality is the there's a black elite that's completely disowned 
Western rule of law, even the people who uphold it, like current justices, they go, okay, well, the end game is actually to replace this system. So no one really believes in it. Um, and the DA is sitting here going, well, what we're trying to do is we want to avoid this, uh, this, uh, this civil war. Okay, we're already in a situation where we have civil war levels of violence. Uh, we want to avoid uh, losing the rule of law. Yeah, well, how long are you going to hold on to this? Do you really think you're going to westernize the majority of the country that already thinks that this system's bollocks? You're just delaying the system long enough for it to be completely irreversible when it does collapse. That is what is being done. That's, that's, that, that, is, that is what's being guaranteed. By trying to win a coalition that will dominate South Africa, you are guaranteeing that South Africa will become like Zimbabwe, only much more disgustingly violent. Because the end game will be the complete destruction of the minorities. Um, it's, this, this, is just, this is just a fact. And the question is, do you think that we deserve to survive? Do you think that we deserve to determine in any way at all how we live? Do you think that we deserve to live in a world where we are free and safe and can provide for the next generation of people? If you, if you agree with any of those things, then those things are worth fighting for. Those mm. things are worth taking up arms for. Those things are worth dying for if you have anyone in your community that you even care about slightly. Mm. And, well, to say uh, that we, we do, and to say then that you think that civil war would be the worst thing that, it, that can happen to this part of the country, I think you're fooling yourself because what you can have instead is that every single ge successive generation is subjected to more and more increasing levels of barbarous violence that is decentralized. It is based on the logic of the marketplace. It is based on the logic of arbitrary spite. And it will continue until we are buried in Stone Age rubble. Hmm. The well, question uh, is, will you... you know, it's, yeah, well, uh, finish that sentence. Uh, you know, uh, uh, do, you want, uh, do you want to... Do you want to die or do you want to take your medicine? That's really the question <laughs> you have to ask. Well, South Africa is going to be a fascinating case study, specifically for people on the outside looking in. There's just so many uh, ideological and communal dynamics going on here. And uh, all these different elements interacting with each other in different unique ways, I think, is a, a very valuable case study for people looking at us. Now, the thing about South Africa is that you, I think I'm also very pessimistic about the future of South Africa. But I think there's definitely a lot of uh, potential within Southern Africa hmm. for to find solutions within within the the chaos and all the opportunities that come with it yeah yeah i mean uh, th th there is the there is that whole thing that we hear um i mean look we're both part of the same social movement broadly speaking you and i and the idea is for is to push for enclave societies that um can survive in the midst of whatever this is i mean look i have mm -hmm. i have my reservations because i mean one one of the things that you know you, you've got to worry about is how 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 big does your community have to be before it can survive long term? I mean, and I think that I think that sort of mid ta mid sized towns of you know thirty to forty thousand people um, that they're going to struggle. I'm going to struggle. And the thing is that, you know, you can talk about the breakdown of the rule of law and the emergence of an anarchy in which the private use of security will protect you. But there does come a point because where, where that's, no, that's no use. Because if your community is small enough, then even the most incompetent state can present a violent threat to you that you cannot resist. And that, unfortunately, is reality. And... Mm -hmm. If if they decide, it's, let's say you've you've got a small town in the middle of the Karoo, and you're running it fairly nicely, but you are of an ethnicity the government does not like or want to let own things. They can take you out, eventually. I mean, they could just cut off your supply, your trade supplies, and let you starve to death. 
-hmm. and then they wait for you to come out. Even the most incompetent people could achieve this. And this is the reality. So without without gilding the lily too much, you, you know, you need to find a way to claim a large enough piece of territory to have a functioning state and at, and at, and at least mostly self-reliant economy. Hmm. There's no other way. Um, before we continue, I just want to, uh, so a while back already, uh, Hatskop Software gave a 70 Rand Super Chat. Thank you very much, Hatskop Software. This is a guy making a Boer War game. Uh, so go check out that username on Twitter. I think he. Uh, I think if you just type that in, you'll find him. He posts regular updates on what's going on there. Very, uh, very cool stuff. And then uh, Dabble Smith gave another 14 Rand Super Chat and said, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, I think that's good yeah. advice for, uh, for Africa. Uh, if you want to survive here and then increasingly there was everywhere else <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there was another comment here that i also saw uh, oh yeah <laughs> uh, matthew dixon says don't be so negative robert yeah well i mean uh, look i appreciate that it's unpleasant and i appreciate it's not great but you know the the, the thing is that when i look around me i see uh, the vast majority of people in this country have they have this kind of complacency, you know, even people who know that it's quite awful, the things are quite awful. They have this strange sort of thing of like, well, you know, it, it can't get any worse. And the thing is, knowing that things can always get worse, no matter how awful they are, as, as, as ugly a truth as it may be, counts as motivation. Um, and realizing that is, is actually important. Everything can always get worse and everything can always get better. And realizing that those two things are true sort of means that, well, you know, you, you, have to, you have to at least tread water. And most people are not. We're just sort of floating. Um, and I, I worry that a lot of people are sort of letting us sink. Um, and, I mean, look, you know, there are a lot of people out there who provide carrots and provide sort of pep talks and so on. And... You know, you can look around for those guys around, and and they're out there, and m many of them are people we know. Um, but uh, I, I sort of think occasionally one needs to sort of look down and remember how serious things are, and why, you know, why you need to take to take the problem seriously. Um, just, <laughs> just every now and again. Hmm. No, well, uh, I think that's definitely a topic that uh, we're going to have to discuss on a future episode. Before I give you the opportunity for your your final words uh, on this uh, on this stream and the things that we've discussed, I'd like just like to use the opportunity to uh, thank again Bidvice for uh, sponsoring this episode. So, uh, Bidvice is the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your own self custody, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange. You don't have to trust anyone to hold your Bitcoin for you. This removes the largest risk associated with crypto and Bitcoin. And if you are interested in learning about Bitcoin, check out their podcast, Buy the Horns. And that's available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. And they release weekly episodes that focus specifically on the South African context surrounding Bitcoin. And then also, um, for those that uh, remember, they've been sponsoring my show for a while now. Um, their minimum purchase size was 20k uh, a while back, but that's been reduced to 5,000 uh, rand recently. You can now buy Bitcoin directly to your hardware wallet uh, in a matter of seconds through them. So if you're interested in getting into crypto or just have some questions or are curious even, you can go uh, check out their podcast, but also go to their website and go uh, just send them a question and they'll get back to you very fast. Uh, there's a link in the description if that's uh, something that interests you to go check it out. Uh, I think they're doing great work and I think they'll be able to answer your questions very suffi sufficiently. So, Robert, there's a the comment here that I actually want to highlight that I think um, I found very funny. And that's under it says R.W. Johnson is more negative than Robert. Yeah, he is. <laughs> well, I mean, the, look, the difference is phenomenal R. W. writer. John yeah, no, dude, he's, he's the he's the he's the uh, he's the he's the. Chief Utakasi out here. He's the he's the big he's the big wizard. So, yeah. um, but I think the difference between him and me is that I'm still young and I think things can be done. He's an old guy and he's yeah. going, ah, it's, a, it's over. Just yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so he's he's sort of like a he's sort of like a South African version of Peter Hitchens in many ways. Um, 
uh, and that he's sort of saying, well, you know, I'm just do he's just documenting the decline, as, as mm -hmm. Chin says. Um, there was, it was fantastic. I saw one of these uh, memes that circles around in, in sort of proper conservative British circles on Twitter, where they did like an electoral map of, of Britain uh, with Peter Hitchens in the corner, like you put one of those little sort of news commentators. Hmm. And every seat in Britain was painted black. <laughs> and then you had like the parties in the corner that said, uh, you know, red for Labour, blue for Conservative, yellow for Lib Dem, black for unending despair. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Hitchens actually retweeted that, believe it or not. Mm. Um, and I thought that was fantastic. I think he's got a terrific sense of humor, specifically for if you compare his age to the uh, to the the social media age. I think he fits in very well. I think he uh, he, he actually plays he's, the game quite well. He, he's found a very idiosyncratic way of engaging with people, and. Um, mm. Um, it, it, it is very, very old fashioned. Um, mm. th but it's not the sort that's of what I, that's what I'm talking it about. Does. It does, it does. <laughs> he's, 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 he's great, he's a legend out there. Um, he's also a very nice guy. I spoke to him, managed to mm. speak to him once. Um, mm. oh, well, that's a, but, that's a uh, great honor. Yeah, no, it's like I mean, you, you sort of all of these elders that you, you meet occasionally you go, Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I met one of them before, <laughs> before they went. It's like you know, seeing seeing the passing of some like majestic species that no longer exists mm. um, uh robert as a final uh a final thought i think i'm going to bring up this comment from sideliner opinions who says robert you must not underestimate the tenacity of the boer i'm worried about the kps who always want to feed the crocodile i no, i agree i, mean, I understand exactly what he's saying um i mean th th that's sort of the great that's one of the greatest problems over here is that you have the the main community life is still dominated by a certain flavor of cape anglo who mm. are absolutely tenacious about defending themselves from any kind of popular morality because they're completely enlightened and they refuse to engage in any kind of serious questions about how rule of law safety prosperity are achieved and sustained um they they absolutely don't understand it, don't care to understand it, don't care to listen to you if you have a different perspective. Um and they're 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 a weak chain in every system that they appear in. Um and I was one of them myself. So I I kind of know why, you know, where it comes from. So hmm. yeah. all right. Well uh Rob, I see uh, Dabble Smith says good chat. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dabble. Thank you for your Pleasure. super chats and thank you for tuning in. Uh, Rob, thank you very much uh, for joining me here tonight for this chat. Uh, there are some points that are a bit uh, pessimistic, I reckon, but I think uh, we can address that in a future episode. It was absolutely fascinating uh, listening to your more elabor uh, elaboration on uh, what I already read in your essay. And people should be watching uh, out for uh, on Whippinor's website for when that essay of Rob is going to be published. It goes much yeah. more in depth than we've been able to cover here on the show here tonight. Yeah. But thank you very much, uh, Rob, for your time. Uh, always a, a pleasure speaking to you. And then also thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. Your comments and your questions uh, really add to the add to the content, and it adds depth to the conversation as well because you're participating in it too. And it makes it a little bit more active than uh, some of these news channels that just uh, pretty much disable their comment section. I see News Twenty Four has now for a while had their live chat disabled. Maybe it's maybe it's for the better. Well, I mean, I was I was blocked by Mail and Guardian because I used to chirp them mm -hmm. under literally every article that they uh, that they published. So, <laughs> no, I was uh, I was blocked by Nassim Taleb this week uh, or last week. Oh, okay. It was actually well, all, very you have funny. To, all you have to do is like uh, like someone who is making fun of him and right. your band. I think that was my sin. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much, guys. And I see uh, everyone seems to have enjoyed the chat very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, Samus says, uh, buy, buy chaps, uh, buy all chaps off to the Jolly Pub now. Well, enjoy that. I hope you have an excellent Jolly time. To Freighter Watcher that always tunes in, uh, thanks, says thanks to Robert, as always, enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much to Freighter for tuning in. And the sideline opinion is going to be the last comment that I read tonight. Says, uh, thank you guys, keep your eyes wide open and your ears to the ground. We shall survive. Well, thank you very much. Let's end on that white poll. So, cheers, guys. Yes. Have a good one and God bless.